Hey, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Jackie and Megan, for all your work behind the scenes in, in uh, making this happen. Um, hello to everyone. And it's so great to be with you here at our first webinar of the season. And I'm, uh, I'm looking outside and seeing that the weather is fantastic. So perhaps after we learn all about tree and shrub identification, you can get out in the field today and start to practice your work. So um, I, I have the great pleasure of introducing our panelists today. And I'm also lucky enough to work with them uh, every single day. So first, I'd like to introduce Adam Brylowski. He's our manager of conservation and trail and has been with the Bruce Drug Conservancy for over 10 years. Adam has a background in or urban forestry and ecological restoration, a Bachelor of Environmental Studies from York University, and a postgrad certificate in ecosystem restoration from Niagara College. Prior to working for the BTC, Adam worked for the forestry department at the City of Toronto as a natural resource management technician as well as an organization called Urban Forest Associates that work to restore degraded natural spaces in Toronto. So welcome, Adam. And then Brian Popolier is our talented land stewardship coordinator where he utilizes his skills and builds on years of experience to perform ecological inventories on over 12,000 acres of BTC managed land and to prepare the management plans for the BTC properties that we own. Um, Brian also supports the clubs in their stewardship efforts, helps out with encroachment and ecological issues in all of our properties. Uh, Brian holds a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Science and Biology from Trent University, as well as certificates in ecological land classification, bird and plant identification, butternut assessment, Ontario pesticide forestry license, and Ontario wetlands evaluation. Brian can often be found in the forest watersheds of Ontario, hiking, fishing, taking pictures, camping, or simply enjoying nature's beauty. And welcome to you, Brian. So we've got some really talented panelists and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm, I'm the, the Brian part of the Brian Adams show. Um, so I'm gonna start off the presentation here. Um, so we're talking about trees and shrubs and how to identify them. So first of all, um, the Bruce Trail, you know, it goes along the Niagara Escarpment. So there's over 1,500 species of vascular plants um, that, that kind of runs along the Niagara Escarpment. So that, that includes 40% of Ontario's rare flora. Um, it's also the oldest trees in Canada, east of the Rocky Mountains, um, is, is included along the Niagara Escarpment. And that's our um, eastern white cedar. Um, a lot of times when you're hiking, you, you see a, a stunted small little cedar growing out of the side of the cliff that tree is possibly could be 800 years old or older so it's it's amazing the tenacity um, of our trees that we do have along the escarpment um, so the, the Niagara escarpment and the Bruce Trail they also cross two different forest zones so if we have a look at our little map here so the the, the green shaded area that's the deciduous forest zone or Carolinian forest zone. So it contains, uh, it has 25% of Canada's human population. So it's very, very populated in, in this area. And uh, it's, a, it's a smaller zone, but it actually has more endangered and rare species than any other life zone in Canada. Um, it's, it's just an, an incredible area. We see a lot, a lot of tree species in this area that um, we don't really, really see north of that zone. Um, and a lot of it comes from, you know, the, the United States, the Eastern United States. So we also cross the mixed forest zone, or it's also called the Great Lakes St. Lawrence forest zone. So it's the second largest forest zone in Ontario. So it's represented by the, uh, the purple on our, our map there. So it contains 19% of the province's forest and covers approximately 20 million hectares. It's huge. So this is the transitional zone between the Southern Carolinian forest and then the Northern Boreal forest, um, which is the, the blue section there. So we're talking about trees and shrubs. So trees are kind of categorized um, as either deciduous trees or coniferous trees. So our deciduous trees are basically the ones that, that lose their leaves um, in the winter. So you can see on this slide, there's, there's a few examples of uh, some of the more common trees that you'll see along the Niagara Escarpment. So we talked about the 
Carolinian zone. So this is the zone that has some of these special trees that, that are found nowhere else in Ontario. So here's some, some more examples of some deciduous Carolinian trees and shrubs. Um, several of the species in the Carolinian zone um, are rare in Ontario. And one example is the Eastern flowering dogwood there that you see with the, you know, the, the beautiful white flowers, very large flowers. So when it's in flower, <clears throat> you, you, can't, uh, you can't miss it. And there's uh, some other common trees in the deciduous zone. So now we go to our coniferous trees. So these are the ones that basically keep their, their needles. Um, even though they're, they, they have needles, they're, they're still considered leaves, but they're just called needles in, in uh, you know, common terms. So there's a few good examples of, once again, some very uh, common coniferous trees that you're gonna see along the trail, um, including Eastern Hemlock, White Pine, the Balsam Fir, Eastern White Cedar, and some White Spruce. So what, why do we ID trees? Um, basically, as ecologists and biologists, we need to name trees because we need to know what species is there. And by knowing the, the name of the tree and what species it is, it opens up a whole new gateway of, um, for more information. So when we know there's an area with certain trees, we also know what other species are gonna be in that area because they either feed or breed um, in certain trees. And that helps us learn about the different habitats and ecosystems um, along the Niagara Escarpment. And uh, myself and Adam, part of our work is we, um, we ID um, different habitats by what plant species are there. So for instance, if there's a forest and the most abundant species is sugar maple, then it's basically classified as a sugar maple forest. And by knowing that, we also know what's gonna be um, in the understory of that forest. We know what kind of plants are gonna be in the ground layer of that forest. And then that allows us to know what kind of um, fauna species that we're probably gonna find in that area. And IDing trees, it also helps us assess biodiversity. So um, biodiversity, the more trees you have, um, the more different species of trees you have, the more different species of shrubs you're gonna have, the more different species of um, ground vegetation you're gonna have. And then that's just keeps building. The more species of insects, of birds um, is gonna be in that area. So it's, it's IDing trees, is, is, it's, it's not only an important part of an ecologist's job, but it's, it's fun to do, right? It's just going out and knowing what's there. Um, I find it very fun. So how do I ID trees? So basically there's a whole bunch of features that we have to look at to identify a tree. Um, the first thing that we look at is, is what kind of leaves are on the tree. So leaves are arranged differently on different species of tree. So as you can see in the slide, you have the alternate arrangement which means that one leaf or twig emerges from each point along the, um, the twig or the stem. So the opposite arrangement is when two leaves or twigs emerge from each point from the on opposite sides of that stem. And then you have world, which is three, three or more leaves or twigs emerge from each point along that stem. So you can see it very easily identified in those three pictures, how the different leaf arrangement works. So now we got the leaf edges. So not all leaves are, are the same. Um, so we use the term entire. So that means the, along the, the edge of the leaf, um, it's, it's very smooth. So there's, there's nothing else. There's no teeth or anything. It's just a, a nice smooth edge. You have toothed leaves. Or as you can see in the picture, they have like little points or jagged edges that run along the, um, the edge of the leaf or the leaf margin. And then you have lobed leaves. So that means that the leaf edge is kind of divided into sections, as you can see on that, uh, that slide there with that maple leaf. Now we got leaf types. So as you can see, it's very important. Leaves are very important when you're looking at trying to identify a tree. So you have simple leaves. 
So that means one leaf blade is emerging from each bud along the twig or the branch. Then you have compound leaves, which means multiple leaf blades, or we call leaflets, emerge from a single bud. So you can see in the picture, the simple, simple leaf, it's, that's why they call it simple. It's just a, one simple leaf coming out off the twig. And then you got the compound, which is then divided into pinnate, pinnately compound or palmately compound. So you see the palm, palmately compound is kind of like fingers coming from your hand. So the leaves are kind of coming from one point. Then when we turn to coniferous trees, they have uh, needles or scales. So they're still in biological terms, these are still considered the, the leaves of the tree, but term, for terminology sake, we, we call them needles or scales. So needles are generally long, long and thin or long and short. Sometimes they can be a little um, stubby and thin or stubby and, 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 and uh, long. And then the other scales, basically the only tree that we have that has the scales would be the Eastern white cedar, but you can see the difference in the pictures. So we talked about leaves. So what other features do we use to identify trees or shrubs? So we use the, obviously the leaves, which we just talked about, um, the buds where the leaves emerge from in the spring. We look at the bark. Bark's a very important feature of the tree that helps us identify it. The flowers and the fruit are very important. The habitat in which the, the tree is growing is also a, a way of identifying trees. Certain, tre certain tree species, I'll use uh, ash trees for instance. White ash likes to grow in like a forest environment and very rarely do you see it in wet habitats. Green ash, however, and black ash, they like wet areas, so they like swamps. And then the growth forms, kind of what the tree looks like. So let's take a look at some of the features of some of the trees that you can find along the Bruce Trail. <clears throat> so our first tree is the sugar maple. Probably the most abundant and common species that you're going to find along the Bruce Trail and the Niagara Escarpment. So I think everyone's familiar with a uh, maple leaf. That's what's our, uh, on our national flag. And um, so it has lobed, lobed leaves that come, come opposite off of the, um, off the twig. So it's divided into three to five lobes. So the buds, so they're covered in brown scales. So that's to your upper right. So then you have the bark, which is kind of divided into vertical ridges or flakes. So the fruit of the maple tree, we, we call them keys. You can see the picture in the far left. So these are the ones that in the fall, when the, when the seeds are falling, they kind of twirl like little helicopters. So if you get a good wind, in the fall, you can just see this, like the sky around a maple will just be filled with these little falling, twirling seeds. So sugar maples, they like moist to dry forest. So like I said, the majority of our forests along the Niagara Escarpment <clears throat> are basically full of sugar maple. Um, they have a nice rounded crown when they're mature. Um, and then, so the fun fact for sugar maples, so they're used for uh, maple syrup production, which I think everyone, everyone knows. So when we're talking about IDing trees, this is why it's very important that you have to look at all the different aspects of the tree. Because uh, right here we have four other species of maple that you can find along the, the Bruce Trail and the Niagara Escarpment. So you can see in each picture how the leaves are similar but they, they're slightly different. So this is where you kind of look at the leaves, you look at the bark, look at the buds, and you look at the different keys. And that kind of putting all those characteristics together allows you to identify down to species of what tree you're looking for. So 
So then our next tree that we're gonna look at, so this is the American beech. Once again, it's a very, very common tree. Most easily identified by its bark. It has a nice smooth um, bark that kind of looks like elephant skin. A lot of times we talk about the beech tree looking like an elephant leg standing in, in, in a forest. So it's got alternate leaves, simple, and they're toothed. So along the edges, they have that uh, toothed edge. The buds are very um, identifiable in American beech as well. So they have that long, narrow bud coming off the, the end of the twig. The fruit is a spiky beech nut. Um, a lot of times up north in the Bruce Peninsula or Gray County, you'll see a big beech tree. It'll have these long scratches on it. So basically what's happening is a bear, American black bears, go out be beech nuts. So what they do is they climb the tree and they feast on these, on the, on the beech nuts of the American beech. Beech love uh, dry forest habitat. So we see them a lot of times mixed with uh, sugar maples. And they have a nice oval shaped growth form. And I already talked about the fun fact. So many, many species of animal, not only the black bear, love, love the, the, the nuts of, of the beech trees. So now I'm going to throw it over to Adam to talk about some other species of trees that we can find along this garden. Thanks very much, Brian. And uh, hello to everybody. Thanks for tuning in this morning. Um, one thing I'd just like to mention quickly is that um, a big thank you to Mara McAfee, who is one of our newer staff members on the conservation team for helping to put together this presentation. Uh, so I'm going to start here with white ash. So Brian sort of uh, mentioned ash trees and how they um, they differ in, in their habitat type uh, requirements. White ash is um, it's generally a tree that likes sort of drier forests, uh, rich forests. Um, and one of the, the, the key identifying factors for white ash is that it's opposite. So uh, again, Brian mentioned that there's a big difference between alternately arranged leaves and oppositely arranged leaves. There's only a few trees in Ontario that are actually oppositely arranged. Ash is one of them, maples are also one of them. So if you generally, if you look at a tree and you notice that the, the leaves or the branches are coming out at the same point opposite from one another, then you can narrow it down generally to either an ash or a sugar maple tree. So with, with ash, they are opposite. They have a pinnately compound leaf. So um, depending on, on the species, you can get uh, five to 11 leaflets coming off of a single stem. And the buds look like a, somewhat like a deer hoof or a chocolate chip, if you're looking at them. Very, very different from sugar maple buds, which are pointier, um, where the, the ash buds are sort of little nuds. You can see in the bottom right corner there, they have a, a bit of a chocolate chip look to them. White ash is also known for its bark, which is uh, sort of tight diamond shaped ridges that you can see in the uh, bottom left picture there. So it's, it's very characteristic to have uh, the, these sort of diamond shapes patterns in, the, in, the, in the, the stem of the tree, as opposed to sugar maple that has this bark that sort of comes off in ridges, vertical ridges, as Brian mentioned. The, uh, the fruit is, is somewhat similar to a maple key, but it's different in the sense that it's just a singular winged seed that the ash produces and drops to the forest floor. It also gets carried by wind with that helicopter effect, but not quite as, as well as, as uh, maple keys, which can go greater distances. As I mentioned, the, the habitat is dry, moist, dry to moist woods, generally upland. Um, you don't get to see white ash uh, in, in lower floodplain areas or alongside rivers that would generally be a green ash or a black ash that you'd be seeing there. And uh, the growth form is sort of a, a cone shape or, or slightly rounded. Uh, obviously when it comes to the growth form of a tree, it depends on where it's grown. If it's a forested, a forest grown tree will um, tend to be straight taller and straighter because they're competing for, for sunlight with their surrounding trees. Whereas a tree in an open field that's grown with all uh, available sunlight, it, it, it tends to branch out more and take advantage of that sunlight. So they, um, they produce a more round crown where the branches start lower down to the ground. 
um, a fun fact, I guess it's not that fun, but it is a fact, is that uh, the white ash and every other ash species is a host for the emerald ash borer, which you may have heard of. It's a um, invasive insect that uh, came over um, from Asia and it's basically devouring all of our ash trees. So along the Bruce Trail, it's been found in pretty much every municipality. And as of now, there's no long-term solution that I'm aware of for its pre uh, to prevent it. <laughs> Although there are um, chemicals that you can inject into your ash tree and you have to do that annually from what I understand. And that will stop them, but um, you know, it's a couple hundred dollars a year. So it's not really, uh, it, it's cost prohibitive to do that on a large scale uh, in, in the forest. So our, our trail guys are actually out there um, having a look at ash trees frequently because these are posing to be a hazard right now along the trail. American elm is another uh, common tree and it's also a tree that uh, has unfortunately be de been decimated by a um, uh, introduced disease and that's the uh, Dutch elm disease. Um, getting into its identification though, it's a uh, alternately arranged tree, so the, the leaves and stems come out at opposite points, uh, alternate points along the stem. It's a uh, simple leaf, leaf uh, so it just has one leaf, doesn't have uh, compound leaves like an ash tree does. It's double toothed, so the edges of the leaf look very saw-like, and it's sort of asymmetric. So as you can see on the upper right hand picture, the, um, the, the stem or the twig of the elm tree is actually sort of like a zigzag and that's very characteristic. The buds are reddish brown and um, again they sort of work in that zigzag zag pattern. They also really hold onto the, the stem tightly. So uh, apart from the terminal bud, which is the top one, the remaining buds are, are fairly tight to the stem. So you'll be able to notice that the bark is um, also very characteristic and it's somewhat corky. On mature, uh, mature American elm trees, the bark is gray and it's sort of gnarly looking and flaking. And if you put your, push your finger in it, you can feel a little bit of sponginess because it has that sort of cork feel to it. Um, and the, the seeds, they are little sort of uh, ovals that have papery wings on them that allow them to be picked up by the wind. You can see those on the, the right hand side of the screen. Habitat, it prefers sun, but it can also uh, definitely thrive in moist soil. So you can see elm trees growing alongside riverbanks or sort of down at the bottom of valleys where the, the water is a little bit more abundant. The soil is, is richer and moister. They do well in a, a, a variety of different habitats. One of the most characteristic things about American elm is the, the vase shaped growth form. So if you look at the far left picture, um, it's not quite as easy to see with all the foliage there, but it has this very distinct vase shape. So it kind of uh, starts at a point and then triangularly goes up into a, uh, an open sort of vase shape. And that's something that you can really notice if you're looking from afar and uh, you'll see the difference between uh, an elm tree or a sugar maple tree just because of the growth form. So a fun fact about the American elm is that there are certain varieties or certain uh, agencies that are working on making a disease resistant uh, elm tree. And one of the um, organizations that's doing this, and we're very fortunate to, to be involved with this, is the Gosling Foundation through a, um, a plant research uh, station that they have in the University of Guelph. And for those of you that don't know, Philip Gosling is one of the pioneers of the Bruce Trail, and he uh, continues doing his philanthropic work for conservation. And he has offered, uh, or he has led the creation of a number of, uh, about a thousand disease resistant American elm trees. And uh, we're working with him in order to plant those along the Niagara Escarpment uh, in order to try and bring back the American elm into our forests. Basswood is another deciduous tree that we have in abundance along the, the Bruce Trail and the, the uh, Niagara Escarpment. The leaves um, are almost heart-shaped at the base. They have a very huge sort of divot where the uh, stem attaches to it, the leaf stem attaches to it. 
they're alternate and they're simple. And uh, these are some of the bigger leaves that you're gonna see on trees in, in Ontario. And with younger trees, sometimes leaves get a little bit larger. They grow larger in order to uh, really soak up all of the sun. And I've heard this tree be called the elephant leaf, elephant ear leaf tree, because the leaves can get so, so massive. Um, the buds are smooth and, and pink to brown, somewhat shiny as well. The bark, uh, to me, is one of the most characteristic things of the basswood. It's uh, got long, narrow, vertical ridges. And what it looks like to me is uh, if you bake a cake and you take it out of the oven and the sort of top has broken open a little bit and there's little ridges in there, that's exactly what basswood bark looks like to me. It looks like you've baked it and it's just splitting apart. Uh, the flowers, uh, it, they have very fragrant yellow flowers you can see in the bottom right corner and the fruit ends up being a, a, a sort of round hard fruit that's inedible but it uh, carries the seed of the basswood. The habitat is similar to sugar maples and American beech, sort of dry woods. You generally don't find this in abundance or dominating a forest canopy, the basswood, but it's more of a, um, a complementary tree. So it, it's sort of uh, scattered throughout the forest. Uh, its growth form is somewhat of a pyramid shape with drooping branches. You often see a uh, basswood tree with multiple stems coming out from uh, one origin and sort of growing out on a diagonal um, from the base of the tree. Fun fact is that the inner bark was uh, traditionally used for making baskets and rope and the the wood is actually really really well known for carving because basswood is very very soft and you can carve it easily. So we're going to move on to black cherry which is another really distinct tree that we find along the Bruce Trail. Um, before I get into anything with the leaves, uh, I'll mention that, you know, that's, if you look at the bark on the uh, upper left picture, it looks like burnt cornflakes. And that's exactly what we tell everybody when we're trying to get them to identify black cherry. It looks like someone's glued burnt cornflakes onto the, the side of this tree. Uh, the leaves are simple, so they come out just one leaf at a time from each bud. They're alternate and uh, they're minutely toothed. You can see in the bottom right corner there, there's a picture of a, of a black cherry leaf. So there's slight teeth along the edge and they have this oval or lance shaped leaf. Underneath the leaf, this is also very important for identifying black cherry. If you turn the leaf over and you look near the base of the leaf stem, um, right sort of uh, right at the bottom of the, the leaf stem, you'll see a little bit of orange fuzz along the stem where the leaf attaches almost. And that's something that's unique to black cherry as well. The buds are cov covered in uh, glossy reddish brown scales. And as I mentioned, the bark, it looks like burnt corn flakes. Uh, the fruit and the flowers, so the, the fruit is actually a cherry and it's uh, edible, although it's not necessarily that palatable. They come from white blossoms, cherry blossoms that um, generally we don't get to see as often because they're high up in the tree canopy. But a fun fact about the, um, the cherries is that the uh, early settlers made use of them by adding uh, a bunch of black cherries to a bottle of rum and then just letting it sit there for a couple months and you'd uh, have this drink that they described as cherry bounce. So that helped them bounce around the woods, I guess. Uh, in terms of habitat, open fields, woods, thickets, uh, we see black cherry popping up a lot after um, uh, in pine plantations or coniferous plantations. So it's a species that will get in and start growing up underneath um, manually planted plantations here and help to restore the deciduous tree canopy. Uh, in terms of its growth form, it has somewhat of an oval shaped crown. And a fun fact is that you can make jam out of it. You just gotta add lots of sugar. Trembling aspen is another deciduous tree that we see, uh, it's very common. On, uh, in, in Ontario, um, we call this a pioneer species. And, and that uh, refers to ecological succession. And ecological succession is the, the um, uh, process of going from uh, no trees or just open 
dirt grass habitat to a full-on mature forest. And trembling aspen is a species that will thrive in open sunny locations and it grows very, very quickly and um, sort of creates a tree canopy that allows for other species to come in like sugar maple and American beech that can grow underneath uh, shade. Trembling aspen, however, needs full sun. It can't grow in the shade. So its leaves uh, are characteristic in that they sort of have a triangle shape, slight tooth along the edges. They are alternate. Um, and, and the reason that it's called a trembling aspen is because the leaf stem is actually attached uh, vertically to the leaf instead of it being straight on. So it tends to sway more and it gives that sort of shimmering trembling effect that uh, the, the named the tree trembling aspen. The, bud, the buds are uh, pointy with reddish brown scales, but the bark is much more um, distinctive and it's, it all has somewhat of a birch tree look to it. It's pale, it's smooth with these dark ridges on it. As the trees get older, it can turn greenish, somewhat of a greenish color. And generally these trees, they, um, they, they tend to bend and they get crooked. And so they, they, they're not necessarily completely straight tall trees as they mature. The, um, the fruit is a green capsule with fluffy seeds. In the springtime, uh, if you notice that there's a lot of fluffy um, seed material, flying around, that's generally because there's a poplar nearby that's uh, just flowered and it's gone to seed. And habitat, in terms of habitat, open, disturbed areas, um, anything that just, uh, you know, needs to be populated by trees. If it's an open area, uh, trembling aspen will get in there and take a hold. The growth form, it's uh, slender with somewhat of a short crown. As I mentioned, it's, they can be straight trees, but they can also be somewhat crooked. And a fun fact is that they can form genetically identical colonies and one of the largest living organisms on the planet is actually a colony of trembling aspens. So when I say a colony, I mean there's one parent tree that sends out roots and those roots send up shoots to, um, uh, to form identical trees. So they're all genetically identical. It's part of the same tree. This um, particular trembling aspen colony has been given a name. Its name is Pando. It's in Utah and uh, it, it actually occupies 108 acres. So it's one individual tree that uh, is, is massive. So moving on to black walnut, again, another deciduous tree. The leaves are alternate and these ones are pinnately compound, kind of like an ash tree with 15 to 23 tooth leaflets. The upper right hand side of the, the screen, you can see a black walnut leaf and uh, the, the individual leaflets on it. The, um, the buds themselves are gray and fuzzy, and you can see a picture of the buds below there. That's very distinctive for black walnut. To me, it uh, almost looks like they look like a hand, like coming up out of the ground, like a zombie hand with a little bit of fuzz on them. And I should mention that uh, another thing about black walnut that I notice quite readily is the, the fragrance. So if you rub the, uh, the leaves or the buds or the fruit, there's a citronella type smell that's um, very distinct to, to walnut. The bark has a deep diamond shaped furrows, somewhat similar to an ash tree, but a little bit more gnarly and knobby. And the fruit is uh, sort of like a tennis ball. Uh, if anyone's lived near a black walnut, you'd be very familiar with these. They dump them on the ground in the fall. And um, if you're a kid, you probably throw them at each other. And you'll notice that they also have that very distinct black walnut citronella smell to them. You, uh, you can uh, remove the shell, the outer shell from the black walnut and roast it and eat it. But I've heard it's not quite as palatable as the English walnuts that we're used to eating. In terms of habitat, it likes open wo uh, woodlands and meadows. And it actually, uh, black walnut creates a chemical that it emits through its roots called juglone, which prevents some other plants from growing underneath it. So this plant can, although it's native, it can be somewhat disruptive to certain uh, ecosystems by uh, growing and it, it also produces suckers and ample fruit to create a uh, sort of dominant presence in an area and the juglone from its roots will prevent other species from germinating it underneath it. 
in terms of its growth form, it's uh, quite open, the rounded crown, the, um, the branches are generally never straight, they're kind of crooked and, and meandering. Um, and in terms of a fun fact, well, the leaf scar looks like a monkey's face. You can kind of see on the bottom left picture there, right to the left, it looks like a, uh, the face of a monkey or an owl. So moving on from, uh, from the walnut, we're gonna chat about the red oak. So oak is another really common uh, species that we find on certain parts of the Bruce Trail, mostly to the south, but we can find red oak specifically all the way up and down the Bruce Trail. Um, oak leaves are fairly unique, and you can see that they're, uh, they have a number of lobes with sharp tips. They're alternate uh, on the, uh, alternately arranged on the branches, and they're also simple, so just one leaf coming out uh, with one bud. The buds have orange or brown scales, and there's a cluster of buds at the branch tip. You can see this in the upper right picture there. Um, cluster of pointy buds. And we, we don't have, um, we're not gonna get into uh, specifics about the white oak or the burr oak, but in terms of identifying red oak versus other types of oak, it's one of the only ones that has those pointy, pointy buds at the top, whereas white oak and burr oak have somewhat more blunt buds. The bark is generally uh, fairly smooth and gray with vertical brown cracks. Um, it's very dense wood as well, very, very hard, dense wood, and they're slow growing, growing trees, red oaks. Uh, fruit is an acorn. Everyone's probably familiar with acorns, so they're, um, you know, the, that's the, the, the method that the, they produce their seed in acorns, and it's good food for, for uh, local fauna. Squirrels love eating uh, acorns, that's for sure. The habitat is dry, moist woods, and in terms of a growth form, it has a dense, rounded crown. Uh, and the fun fact is that sometimes you'll notice that uh, red oaks, specifically younger ones, keep their leaves throughout the winter time. And red oak leaves are very, very high in tannin. They're great for your garden and they kind of help uh, to, to mulch things in. Moving on to the butternut, which is actually the relative of the black walnut. It's in the same genus, which is juglans. Uh, it's slightly different than the black walnut though. In fact, this tree is endangered uh, in Canada and Ontario because of a introduced fungus that is still continuing to ravage the species. So this is an endangered tree that you can find fairly easily on a walk along the Niagara Escarpment if you know what you're looking for. The leaves are alternate and they are pinnate, they compound again with 15 to 23 toothed leaflets. Now, if you look at the top right, picture, uh, that leaf with its leaflets looks similar to a black walnut, but one of the key differences between a black walnut leaf and a butternut leaf is that the butternut leaf, the terminal leaf, the very end leaf, is usually perfect in that it looks similar to all the other leaves, but in a black walnut, that terminal leaf is either absent or it's somewhat deformed, smaller, off to an angle. That's one thing that you can do to look at the difference between butternut and black walnut. The buds on butternut are also similar to black walnut, but they have a, uh, a lighter grayish color to them, also very fuzzy. The bark is also quite characteristic. It's flat ridged, uh, it's gray, it has a lighter gray color to it. As you look up the trunk, the, um, the barks tends to get more and more smooth towards the tip of the branches. And uh, another really big characteristic of butternut is, um, is that they generally all have the disease, the butternut canker, and you'll see black sooty marks on the, the bark as you look up and down the tree. And that's an indication that it's infected by the disease and that it is in fact a butternut. The, um, the flowers and the fruits. So the, the, the fruit is actually very similar again to black walnut in that it's some, some, somewhat of a, a, a husk that's covering a shell, but it, in this case, it's football shaped. So instead of the rounded black walnut uh, seed, you've got a, a football. And similar to black walnut, similarly, you can eat it if it's roasted. And I've heard it's delicious, but it's an endangered tree, so don't eat it. The habitat, it's uh, forest openings and edges. It really seems to like the, uh, the dollar stone, the, the high calcium soil 
calcium rich soil on the Niagara escarpment. So we find it all over the place on the Niagara escarpment. In terms of, a, of its growth form, it's uh, an open rounded crown, generally tends to branch fairly high up, especially if in a, you're in a forest canopy. And the fun fact, again, is it's endangered. So that's, that's a sad thing, but um, we are working uh, to try and help recover the species. Brian and I are both certified butternut health assessors. So we're looking for good uh, disease resistant butternuts while we're at doing our assessments. And we send that information into um, the uh, provincial government in order to, to work on their butternut rehabilitation program. So we're moving on to some conifer trees here and uh, easily the most abundant tree that we find along the Niagara Scarpment is the Eastern White Cedar. And Brian mentioned that this is one of the, one of the trees that can be, be older than any other tree in Eastern Canada. And that's because they can grow uh, right on the edge of the Niagara Scarpment, like a little bonsai tree, just barely hanging on for dear life and uh, growing ever so slowly. The, the oldest Eastern white cedar tree that's been measured here in, in Ontario on the Niagara Escarpment was 1800 years old. That one has since passed away. Uh, the oldest living tree, cedar tree on in this area along the Bruce Trail is uh, 1500 years old. So it's pretty impressive to think that these trees have been holding on for that long. In terms of leaves, uh, they have small scaly leaves that cover the uh, fan shaped twigs. So leaves or scales. Um, they, they don't typically look like leaves to us, but they still are foliage and that's what they do is they photosynthesize and they uh, give uh, energy to, to the tree, so it's a leaf. The bark is flat and has narrow strips. Um, sometimes it comes off a little bit vertically, like, uh, like little bits of string. And in terms of habitat, uh, it can grow in a, a number of different habitats, but it loves wet areas. It loves the edges of uh, swamps and um, wet lowland areas, but we find it also in abundance along the edge of the Niagara Escarpment and, and pretty much anywhere else. It's a very versatile tree and it can grow in a number of different conditions. Uh, in terms of growth form, it has that typical conifer look to it where it's, uh, co it's conical and it's a little bit larger at the bottom than it is at the tip. So it kind of goes to a point like a pyramid and another fun fact about the Eastern White Cedar is it's an important food source for deer in the winter. And not, not only is it a food source, but during uh, times of deep, deep snow, um, like stands of cedar will help to protect the, uh, the deer from that deep snow cover and, and sort of keep them a little bit um, insulated from the effects of winter. Eastern Hemlock is also another conifer. You can see the, the cone in the bottom picture there. And this tree is actually one of uh, three trees that's considered a climax species in Ontario. The other two trees being sugar maple and American beech. And what a climax species is, is basically a tree that can survive in the shade. I mentioned trembling aspens grow up and they provide shade for species like eastern hemlock, sugar maple and American beech which can, can survive in the shade and thrive in the shade. And eventually these species grow up to take over the forest canopy. And then it's a sort of cycle of, of a climax forest because nothing else can grow there apart from Eastern hemlock, sugar maple, and um, an American beech and a handful of other species as well. So a climax forest is one in Ontario at least is dominated by those three species. So the leaves are a flat row of needles that have two white bands on the underside. They're fairly short needles. The bark is deeply furrowed with broad flat topped ridges. Uh, in my experience, it almost has sort of a orangey brown color to it. Very gnarly um, um, bark on the outside. The cones are short uh, and small compared to other, uh, other cones. So they're only one to two centimeters and they're attached by a, a hairy stalk. In terms of habitat, these things are actually quite finicky. They like the cool, shady, moist forests, but when you're trying to plant them for restoration purposes, um, they're incredibly finicky. They need just the right amount of light, just the right amount of, of moisture. So um, yeah, you have to be very, very uh, mindful when you're planting hemlocks during a restoration project. In terms of growth form, it's somewhat conical when young and irregular as they age. They um, they can just sort of last stand as a, a, a small sapling. 
an eastern hemlock can become a small sapling and it can live there for a couple hundred years before it actually pops open if there's a opening in the tree canopy and it can take advantage of that sunlight. So uh, these, you can see a tiny small little twig of a, of a hemlock tree and that tree might be 100 years old. A fun fact is that it's uh, not suitable for firewood because it throws off many sparks. Um, and also this tree was somewhat uh, decimated uh, back during the, um, the pioneer days because its bark was really, really rich in tannins. So um, the settlers would cut them down, remove the bark and leave the wood. And the bark was the, the important part that they would send off to the tanneries. A balsam fir is uh, uh, another conifer that's abundant on the Niagara Escarpment, particularly up on the northern parts of the Niagara Escarpment. There is, you might be able to, or you might confuse this with Eastern Hemlock because it's got flat rows of needles uh, with two white bands underneath, but the balsam fir has much longer needles compared to an Eastern Hemlock. Um, if you see the two side by side, it's, it's impossible to tell to, uh, not to tell the difference. The bark is uh, quite different from hemlock, however. It's gray and smooth, and on younger trees, it has raised resin blisters. So in the picture on the bottom right, you can see these little dots all along the tree. On most balsam firs, if you go walk up to one of those dots and you mush it with your thumb, uh, a bunch of sap will pop out and then you'll be have sticky fingers for the rest of the day. The cones are uh, barrel-shaped and grayish-brown. They're about four to 10 centimeters long, slightly bigger than the Eastern Hemlock. In terms of habitat, it likes forests and swamps. We see it um, very, very abundantly up on the Bruce Peninsula where there's huge stands of balsam fir in the understory. The growth form is pyramidal, like a Christmas tree. In fact, these are uh, favored as a Christmas tree because the needles stay on for a very long time. And um, I really love walking through balsam fir forests because you get to smell that sweet, balsam fir smell that's associated with Christmas, if you ever had a fir tree for a Christmas tree. So we're moving on to uh, eastern white pine. Oh. Sorry about that. Moving on to eastern white pine here, which is probably one of our most distinct uh, conifer trees. Um, you see white pines in group of seven pictures who, uh, you know, famously brought them to the art world. Um, the leaves are, are, or the needles are quite long and they are slender and they come in bundles of five. And that's one of the key characteristics in determining uh, different pine species. The way I remember it is um, the word white has five letters, W-H-I-T-E, and the bundles of needles come in five. So it's an easy way to keep it in your head that if you see a pine tree and you look at the bundles, if there's five of them, white, white pine. The bark is sort of grayish brown, uh, broken into scaly ridges. Uh, the cones are much larger than other conifer cones that we've talked about, eight to 20 centimeters long with spreading scales with pine nuts on the inside. And in terms of habitat, white pines are, they were much more abundant uh, back before colonization of North America, but they were used um, extensively for creating masts for ships because they're such tall, straight trees. So before we could find them a little bit more abundantly in our forests, but now we, we're, we see them more as plantations. So they've been manually planted in order to, um, to create a tree, a, a quick cover canopy, tree cover canopy. And uh, that was sort of the reforestation um, objectives of, of, the, of the 1950s in Ontario is plant conifers, they grow quick, they, they bind up the soil, prevent erosion, and they also provide shade for deciduous trees to grow up underneath to restore, ecologically restore um, the forests that were cut down during the pioneer days. In terms of growth form, it's uh, sort of a very tall straight tree with a pyramidal top. Generally, these are what we call super canopy trees. A super canopy tree is one that exists just above the tree canopy. So if you're standing back and looking at a forest from afar, the little tufts of needles at the top of the canopy are, are generally white pine that are just shooting up and trying to take advantage of, of uh, absorbing as much sunlight as they can. And this is actually the provincial tree of Ontario. So congrats, white pine.
The white spruce is a, a different conifer. Um, the leaves or the needles are short and stiff and they, they surround the twig, very different from hemlock or balsam fir that are flat. Whereas the white spruce, the needles go in sort of like a, all the way around like a brush, some sort of a, like scrubbing brush. The, the bark is gray and scaly and the cones aren't huge. They're three to six centimeters and um, they're blunt tipped. Uh, the habitat, forests, yards, plantations, white spruce is actually fairly uh, diverse in its, its habitat requirements, so it can grow in a number of different areas. Uh, it also grows in con conical form, becoming somewhat uh, spire-like at the top, so it grows to a, uh, in a pyramidal form and then it just has sort of like this long, tall spike at the top of it. In terms of a fun fact, well, it grows in the, the far north and can be found uh, along the Arctic tree line. So very, very versatile tree that composes uh, a, a good chunk of our, our forests along the Bruce Trail. So that's it for the trees that we've talked about. Um, if we want to get into uh, IDing, or if you want to get into IDing trees yourself, there's a number of different great resources. iNaturalist, which uh, is an app that we, the Bruce Trail has a project on. And uh, you can go on there and you can learn about trees. Go Botany is a great website that has in incredible information about native trees. The Minnesota Wildflowers website is also fantastic. And uh, my personal favorite, and it's a book that I've been using for a very long time, is called Trees in Canada by John Farrar. And that's sort of the, the textbook tree, tree book in Canada that, that we use quite often. So I, I'm done there and then we're gonna move on to questions, I think. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much, Adam and Brian. That, that was amazing. And I really did learn a lot. So thanks uh, for, for that uh, really great presentation. I know you've got questions here that you're going to go through. And then there's also been some submitted. So I'll let you answer these first. And then I'll jump back in with the, the new questions. Okay. So um, I'll take the first page of questions here. So the first question is that this person was interested in tips to identify the various spruces we see on hikes. So the most common spruce you're gonna see is the white spruce um, and that's the native spruce. In terms of non-native trees, there's a blue spruce, a Colorado blue spruce, and it's a cultivar that's easily identified by its blue hue and its needles. And it's also somewhat larger than, uh, than the white spruce that we have here. These are the blue spruces are generally planted as, as trees in, in uh, your residence, your residence like in, in front of your house. Uh, Norway spruce is also a common native tree, but it has branches that hang downwards and really large cones, much, much larger than a white spruce. Uh, I, the next question is why was red pine planted so extensively in the 50s and 60s? This is something that I sort of uh, chatted about a little bit in the past here. Um, so it, it was planted mostly for timber production and it grows really fast, but it was also used as a building material. But one of the problems we had when um, you know, the settlers came down in, in, into Ontario was that all of our forests were essentially cut down. So we were left with uh, bare land and this caused a lot of erosion. So one of the strategies was to plant, extensively plant conifers that would bind the soil and they would grow up real quick. You could cut them down and make some money off them, or you could let them grow and then allow nature to, to sort of restore itself by uh, reseeding in with trees like sugar maple, American beech, black cherry, and Eastern hemlock. So it was sort of a strategy to um, make money quick, but also to bind up the soil because we cut down all the forests. Are the plantations gradually being removed is the next question. And the answer is yes and no. So timber companies still use plantations for, uh, for making money, uh, but many conservation organizations thin out plantations to increase biodiversity. And that's something that we do on our Bruce Trail owned land. If we have a, uh, a plantation, a conifer plantation that exists that is viable to be cut, uh, you have to wait for them to be a certain age. Um, we will cut the trees 
And this allows for more light to get into the forest floor and more diversity because a plantation is, uh, is not diverse. It's the opposite of biodiversity. It, uh, you know, generally on pine plantations and other conifer plantations, the soil gets very acidic and it doesn't allow for other plants to grow underneath in abundance. So you've got somewhat of a biodiversity, um, you know, stale zone. There's, there's really not a lot of diversity happening in plantations. So we do actively try to manage them um, to increase biodiversity. Next question is, uh, why are there never any cherries at the base of black cherry trees? Well, I think that's probably because they're so delicious to the birds. Um, we, uh, we very rarely see these cherries after they've matured. And um, yeah, that's, that's the, you can blame it on the fauna, I would say, because they're one of the first things that the birds wanna go and eat and uh, squirrels will also eat them as well. So I'm gonna move along here and Brian, I'll let you take the next, the next page. So we've got a few more questions here. So on the first one is, when does a tree start growing a larger trunk? There are lots of young, spindly and very tall trees and they're so skinny. When did they start thickening? Um, so it, each tree has its own growth factor. So they start to thicken at different ages for each species. Um, Adam touched on the um, eastern hemlocks um, can be, be a sapling for a very long time. So in, in, when you're in a forest environment and it's very shaded, a lot of tree species are also like that. So they remain as a little sapling until there's an opening in the canopy and then boom, they pop up and they start to grow at a faster rate. So that's basically when they start to, to thicken is when, when opportunity arises, they start to grow faster and, and thicken up. Um, so what is the correct name for cedar fronds? So they aren't leaves, so what are they called? So I, I did touch on this question that the coniferous needles, they actually are considered leaves, but um, they're just the common terminology for them is, is needles or fronds. So that, uh, that answers that. So okay, how many types of oaks are there? So how to tell them apart and everywhere along the trail. So in Ontario, there are actually 10 species of native oak tree. So um, you kind of see them listed there. So that's why when you're looking at tree ID, it's, it's very important to look at all aspects of the tree. Um, the leaves, the bark, the, the leaf scars. So that's where the, the, the leaf falls off in the fall. Because um, a lot of these trees like black oak and red oak, pin oak, um, when you're looking at them, they look very, very similar and there's very, very minute details that, um, that you can pick out to identify the tree. Um, a, a lot of times people will send us a picture, they'll, they'll just send us a picture of, of the bark or the leaf and they'll say, what tree is this? And um, a lot of times we say, well, you need to go back and you need to take a picture of the leaf, the bark, the leaf scar, <laughs> and um, the acorn. Um, a lot of times you need all that to identify what, what, what tree it is. So, okay, can black spots on maple leaves kill a tree? So this is, it's a, the black spots you see, a lot of times they, they form in, in, in the late summer and in the fall. So it's actually, it's a fungus that um, it only attacks a lot of times the invasive Norway maple. Norway maple is a very common non-native tree that has been planted in along streets in urban environments. <clears throat> so the, the fungus really, really likes the, the Norway maple. It doesn't really affect the health of the tree. It's, it's more of a cosmetic um, thing to it because it, people see black spots and, oh, it's ugly. But um, yeah, it might look ugly, but it's not really gonna harm, harm the tree. Although the, the black tar spots, they do, sometimes they do um, form on, on our native maples, specifically the silver maple, um, which is also um, planted a lot in the urban environments. So that's it for our questions. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for, um, for answering those. And we do have some new questions that have come in. And so the first question comes from Marsha Courtney and, an, and the question is, is it true when a maple produces an abundance of keys 
that it is sick or fighting a disease. Yeah, okay, I, I can respond to that. So th that can be true, absolutely. That is a, um, a survival mechanism that certain trees have where if they feel like they're at the end of their lifespan, then they'll sort of like put out one last bumper crop year of seeds. Um, and we do see that on maple trees, absolutely. And the, the other indication that you're looking at uh, for trees that are ending the end of their life is um, branches. We call them epicormic sprouts coming out the side of a tree, which is sort of branches where you wouldn't necessarily see branches before, sp spindly little things that look they should, like they shouldn't be there. And that's because um, the, the buds at the top of the tree are starting to die. And those are what we call the, their terminal buds. And generally they're the ones that control the growth habit of the rest of the tree. But once those dies, all the other buds on the tree start saying, okay, now we have a chance to go. But that's, that's generally an indication that the tree is unhealthy. So um, yes, maple trees sometimes do create an abundance of seed while they're at the end of their life. Okay, great. Thanks for that answer. Uh, the next question comes from Susan Spire, and this is interesting. Uh, the question is, how would a tree pass away if not from a specific disease? Do they just dry out and wither from old age? Yeah, so I, that's, that's a great question. And um, I, it is, if it's not a disease, it would be some sort of, of rot. Um, everything has a lifespan. And there's a number of different factors that go into um, tree mortality. You know, it could be disease. It could be the fact that the tree lost a branch and now there's an opening that allows for bacteria and fungus to get inside of it. And uh, eventually that will take over the tree and kill it or changing soil conditions. So um, there, there's a number of factors that, that, that go into why trees die and what their lifespan is but they're so, they're so variable. And one of the, um, the important things to mention here is that invasive species and invasive trees are such a problem because they don't have those diseases that are regulating our native trees. So they could live for much longer because they're, they're not being attacked on all fronts from, uh, by various diseases and fun, fungi and, and rot that affects our trees as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, the next question is, how old can sugar maples on the Bruce Trail live? There are some quite large ones out there, and how old might they be? Yeah, I can uh, grab that one. Um, once again, each, each tree species has its own growth factor. So with regards to sugar maples, we basically, you, you take the the growth factor of the tree and then you multiply it by, by the tree height and that gives you like an estimate. Um, so we have trees that we've estimated along the Bruce Trail to be over 200 years old. So, you know, very, very old trees. Um, certain trees grow slower than other ones. So to, to have a very large maple, it's been around for a long, long time. And um, so, yeah, there you go. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Uh, the next question is, are basswood and linden very similar? I live in St. Catharines, where there are many huge lindens along the streets. And that question comes from Susan Smith. Yeah, so they, they are the same genus. Um, basswood and linden trees, they're in the genus Tilia. Uh, so the linden trees that you commonly see planted on the street are a little leaf linden, which is a European variety. So they're, um, like I said, they're in the same genus, same family as basswood trees, but they're just a different species. So similar, but different. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next question comes from uh, Gerald Martiniuk, and it's, how do you identify a rock elm? Okay, the, the rock elm, the most identifying feature of it is its twigs. Um, they have a very, very quirky appearance to their to their twigs. So it's very rough, rough looking and, and, and quirkiness to it. When you see that, the only other tree species that has, has a similar um, quirkiness to the twigs is bur oak. Um, as, as they grow, they, they can get that same type of, of feature on them. But when it comes down to it, 
it's it's all in, in the buds too. So if you see see a tree with the, the corky twigs, you have to look at the buds. And um, I think throughout the presentation, Adam kind of described the difference between the the buds of the different species. So elm buds look a lot different than, than oak. Um, so when it comes to identifying trees, a lot of times I think you, you take pictures and then you bring those pictures back to your home or wherever, and then you use a good field guide um, to, to have a look at it. So I'm just gonna hold up this book. So this is the Trees of Ontario book that Adam was talking about. That's the Bible of tree identification. It ha has so much information in it and it's so well laid out that um, if I have a question about a tree, tree identification, that's what I go to is that book. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, the next question is from Francis Roberts, and the question is, for the iNaturalist Citizen Bruce Trails uh, project, are there any photos that are more useful to take? So um, we're asking, is, is there any direction that you can give how to add useful photos versus just random photos? Yeah, with, with the iNaturalist app, I use it a lot. And the thing with iNaturalist is you put, you put your pictures up, which allows... Um, experts in identification of whether it be plants or birds um, or whatever, mushrooms. So the thing with the pictures on iNaturalist, because so many, there are so many species such as um, the oak genus that are very, very similar. The more, the more pictures you can take of the different features, the better when it comes to iNaturalist. So if you say you do come across an oak, a picture of the leaf, picture of the bark, a picture of the buds, all that stuff that we talked about during this presentation. And even if you have 10 pictures, it really helps the experts to identify what that species is. Um, another good example is our, our asters in Ontario. There's so many asters that look the same. So you need, the more pictures you put up of the different parts of that, that plant, the easier it is for people um, to identify it through those pictures. Okay, great. And um, just in the interest of time, we've got sort of two more questions for you. There's one that's popped up a few times, and it's um, asking about field guides. And uh, I know that you talked about trees in Canada, but I'm going to uh, remind everybody, and thanks for the great question. I promise it wasn't a plant, but in the 30th edition of the Bruce Trail Guidebook, which is available at brucetrail.org, there is a handy field guide in there that helps you identify trees, wild fly, uh, flowers, and, um, and, and mammals and birds. And so, I'd encourage you to uh, absolutely get this edition and, and it would be helpful as well. Uh, so two more questions and uh, one of them is from Daniel Wilson. Can you talk about marker trees uh, and trees that look like marker trees? Why do they grow this way? And, and yeah. maybe for those that don't know, can you explain what a marker tree is? Yeah, yeah. So, so there is um, some interesting research being done and I believe a, a gentleman named Paul O'Hara wrote a book about marker trees. And those are trees that have been um, bent. And if you, if you see a tree that's sort of like uh, growing and then shortly off the ground, it, it bends at a 90 degree angle and then goes back up again. So it's sort of like an S-shaped tree. And one of the, um, the, the thoughts is that these trees were used uh, by uh, traditionally by First Nations to indicate certain routes um, or certain um, important features, like to topographical features. Um, so we, we do see them all along the Bruce Trail. And, um, you know, like th there's, it, it's hard to know whether or not these tree, each particular tree was specifically made to be that way to indicate some sort of thing, um, or if it was just natural processes. And the reason that that would happen naturally is <clears throat> if a, uh, if a tree was growing and then let's say it's, its neighbor tree fell down and then pushed it to the ground, um, a tree's habit is always to grow up towards the light. So eventually it's going to start growing up. Eventually that tree that fell on it is actually going to die as well and it's gonna rot. So you're left with a tree that's been growing underneath, underneath a fallen tree that's uh, drastically altered its growth habit. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Adam. And then final question, there are some other great ones and you can always reach out to uh, Brian and Adam. You can find their info on our website um, if, if you have specific questions. But uh, for the last question, 
dwarf forests along the Niagara Escarpments have what, we, what is referred to as ironwood. And that question comes from Bob Grant. Yeah, so the ironwood tree, it's, it's its own species. It's, it's generally, it doesn't really grow into the, the canopy of our forest. It's more of an understory tree. So you have like the sugar maples, the eastern hemlocks, the white pines, those are our canopy trees. And then underneath is, uh, you know, these smaller trees. So ironwood, it's, a, it's actually a very easy tree to identify. It has this, the, the bark is in thin strips of um, kind of like bark that's shagging off. So it looks like a very shaggy tree um, with these like nice thin, thin strips. The, the leaves it has tooth leaves that go along the edge, but it's that bark that's mostly the identifying feature of, of ironwood. And then they call it ironwood for a reason. It's a very, very hard wood. Um, a lot of times axe handles, hockey sticks used to be made out of ironwood just because it was such a hard wood and hard to break. So it is aptly named. Okay, great. Well, um, Adam and Brian, thank you so much for all of your talent, skills, and knowledge today and sharing it with the membership. And uh, thanks to all of you that attended today. It was great to spend the morning with you, and I hope you can get out and uh, practice identifying trees. So we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thanks a lot.